talk a little bit more on it. So OSHA tries to keep us safe while we're working. So they're the ones that say, hey, you probably shouldn't lift 200 pounds by yourself. That would probably be a bad choice. Some of them are pretty duh, but some people still. Keisha. Yes. Alright, here we go. I got that one. Woo. So, OSHA ensures that workers are not exposed to unnecessary job risk. Okay. Um, yeah. They apparently, OSHA decided that um, they couldn't use ammunition anymore for the duck hunt. Okay. Uh, those dealing with people in disease. So, uh, healthcare workers, coaches, things like that. Wash your hands regularly. If you're around nasty people, okay, in my line of work, trust us, we wash our hands and use hand sanitizers quite regularly, okay? Wear gloves when you might be exposed to blood or fluids. This is to protect you and it's to protect the other person as well, okay? So, pretty much every single, if somebody has a cut or something like that, um, if I've got to touch it in any way, I'm putting on gloves if at all possible, okay? Because I don't know what they have and they don't know what I have. So, better to be safe. Sharp objects go in a sharps container, okay? Uh, OSHA says that you're supposed to have training for bloodborne pathogens yearly, okay? Occupational injuries must be reported and they can inspect a medical organization at any time. So, they could go to a hospital, they could go to RDH any time and go, oh, okay, cool. We're going to go look and see what, if you're doing everything right. Yeah. What's that uh, inspection medical level? Uh, they can ins inspect medical facilities at any time. Uh -huh. They can probably do it with others as well, but specifically medical facilities, oh yeah, they can do it at any time that they want. Alright, the FDA. <laughs> I love the FDA. Okay. Its purpose, whenever it was created, was to protect the public from harm by requiring that scientific research was done before drugs were approved and before they started being used. Okay? And also regulate how they're distributed. Okay? All approved drugs, this is going to be on your test, must be proven two things. It must be proven safe and effective before marketing. Okay? Typically, eight years or more is pretty common for a company to get approval for marketing, even if it's approved and sold in another country. So there's a lot of drugs that are sold in Europe, okay, and that have made it through their testing, but haven't made it through our testing yet. Hasn't satisfied the FDA, okay. Um, some approvals can be accelerated for those people with conditions that might prove fatal prior to the normal waiting period, okay. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, think of whenever the AIDS epidemic was rampant in the 80s and 90s. The, these were some of these approvals. We'll talk about a couple of different acts that helped with that as well. Okay, the Orphan Drug Act. Okay, it increases and eases the development of drugs for rare diseases. Okay, so if you're the head of a drug company, okay, do you want to spend millions of dollars trying to come up with a drug that takes care of cystic fibrosis, which affects not as many, not too many people, ish, comparatively, than erectile dysfunction, which affects probably half the population at one time or another? Okay, which one do you think is going to get you a better return on your money? Which one do we have more drugs for? I'll give you a guess, it ain't the first one. Yeah, the erectile dysfunction, okay? Is erectile dysfunction a life-threatening problem? <laughs> Carlos is like, I don't know. Never had it. I, don't, I don't have to know that. Okay, it's not, okay? Cystic fibrosis can be, okay? So the Orphan Drug Act, since Pharmacy companies are in it to make money, okay, as most people are. This is a way to try and get drug companies to develop drugs for those rare diseases or those diseases that don't affect as many people that they're not going to get as much money off of, okay. So the FDA.gov um, orphan, orphan um, Drug Act. 
This is actually one of the, you know, this is actually a great thing that they actually did at one time. It's amazing. Nowadays, I don't know if we could get this done. <laughs> okay. Um, but they provide incentives for people to develop these rare drugs, um, things like that. So they get. They have a humanitarian use group as well. I wanted to see. Testing all over the country during that part. 
confirm the effectiveness, monitor the adverse reactions um, from long-term use. Okay, 5,000 started, five into the trials. Okay, this is like Hunger Games on crack. <laughs> sorry, trials, oh, sorry, yeah, I don't know, yeah. okay. Um, only approximately one drug is marketed for every five to ten thousand that's tested. Okay, so this is why they go after the they go after the diseases that affect the most people because they're spending a lot of money on these five to ten thousand different drugs that they're trying to test, and only about one of them is getting actually approved and going out for marketing. Okay. Yep. So they do all this. Okay. Then they file the new drug uh, application. Okay, it goes to the FDA. Usually, that's about a year and a half. They review the process, or review the process. They approve or they don't approve. Okay, so you could go through almost. I think it, this one ends up saying about 15 years total, counting the one and a half years. So you could go through almost 13, 14 years of all this testing and still possibly not get your drug approved. Okay, so that's a lot of money. Okay, uh, phase four, which is what we all help participate in, is additional post-marketing testing required by the FDA. So, whenever we all take ibuprofen or we take whatever medicine that we're talking about that's been approved by the FDA, and all of a sudden it starts having side effects, long-term adverse reactions, think Celebrex, okay, um, that was back um, in the early 2000s, everybody was taking Celebrex as an uh, anti-inflammatory medication, um, and they would use it for long term, they would use it for years. Well, the only problem was, if you used it for years, it would thin your blood, you would start getting ulcers, you would start bleeding, you have internal bleeding, you know, bad things. Well, whenever they did all these clinical trials, they only did it for maybe a couple of months. They didn't do it for 10, 15, 20 years like some of these people. Okay, that was the phase four. They figured out, oh, yeah, these really should be used long term. If they are, here's probably some of the possible side effects. Is that for every drug that comes out? They have to they test it like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, if it's um, if it's some of the accelerated programs, it's going to be a lot shorter. Um, it, they probably aren't going to have to go as strict. But yes, in in theory, every drug that's approved by the FDA, there's a lot of drugs that aren't approved by the FDA, supplements, and we'll talk about those, um, are not approved by the FDA, so they don't have to have any of that testing. But so your ibuprofen, your prescriptions that you get, all of that has to go through the FDA. Okay? Clinical trials, double blind study, so neither the researchers nor the participants know if they're actually getting the drug or if they're just getting the placebo. Okay? So typically what will happen is if Kiana and Alexis are both in a study and I'm the researcher, okay, it's a double blind study, I'm going to give them both a pill. I have no idea which one is getting the actual drug and which one's getting the placebo. Okay? The placebo is the thing that all it does is a pill, but it really doesn't do anything. Usually it's filled with like sugar or something. Okay? So it looks like it should work. Some people will still think that it works, okay? Uh, treatment for these are usually paid, or usually free, sorry, to get volunteers. Um, some are paid transportation costs for participating, especially the healthy groups, typically. Um, whenever you're getting into the patient people, or the people with the disease, they're typically, you know, this is probably the people that need the medicine to work, so they're a little more willing to do things for free, okay? So the phase one goal determine the safety. Phase two, they have the specific disease. They're looking to see if it works. Is it, uh, does it have efficacy? Is it effective? Phase three, again, testing for all of those. They're looking for the lowest amount possible to cause the change that they want, okay? Um, investigational new drug, that's the IND. That's what drug is, the drug is known during the clinical trials, and I'm sure it's a lovely name that none of us can ever say. Okay? Something close to this chemical name. Okay? Chemical names are meaningful to scientists, chem teachers, things like that, mean absolutely squat to the rest of us. Okay? Example, 2,4-isobutyl phenylpropionic acid, 
None of us know what the hell that is. But if I say ibuprofen, all of a sudden, most of us are like, oh, okay, cool, I know what that is. Okay? So a cubicle name is usually very long and very drawn out. Okay? Branding, the company owns the rights to that name. Okay? Typically it's easy to remember and it can indicate the purpose. So example, asthma port. What disease do we think asthma port might treat? Asthma, very good, yes. And a boy, yes, asthma port, okay? So brand name, usually they kind of make it easier to remember some of them, not so much, because we've all seen some of the lovely little thing, you know, the commercials and you're like, I can never remember that name. I can't even say that name. How am I supposed to remember to ask my doctor for whatever miracle drug they say I'm supposed to take? Generic name, this is the common name. So uh, brand name, that's the patent period. So a certain amount of time, um, they're allowed to, they own the rights to that drug. So Nexium, which went to generic not too long ago. Okay, beforehand, Nexium was only a brand name. Okay, it didn't have a generic yet. So they were getting boo hoos of money because they were selling Nexium. Now there's a generic, well, now they don't get it near as much money. They get like two bucks versus 50. So this is after the patented pat period is ended and others can sell at a lower cost. So the difference between Advil and ibuprofen, exact same thing, okay, but different names. Advil is the brand name, okay, or Motrin, things like that. Those are brand names. Ibuprofen, literally the exact same drug. You go look at Walmart. Motrin is here and it's about seven dollars for a bottle of 100. You get the Walmart Equay brand, and it's about three. It's literally the exact same drug. Okay, so generic drugs they have to have the same active ingredient. Okay, they have to have the same dosage form, and they have to be done in the same way. So, if Motrin is given as a pill, then it has to be given in a pill as the generic form. Okay, must be bioequivalent, so it must work the same way in the body. Okay. Uh, manufacturers must show that the generic will remain potent and unchanged until the expiration date. They can look different, but they're going to work in the exact same way. So I, I'll have some people who are like, oh my gosh, I have to have this specific drug or something like that. And I'm like, you need to know that there's a generic for that, right? Like the, a leaf is one of the ones that I hear a lot. And they'll go, well, I have to have a leaf. I'm like, Naproxen sodium that's literally right next to it is about half the price, and it's the exact same drug. They're like, no, it's not. Yeah, literally it is. Okay, so generics, great little things. Now, there are some generics that don't work as well as brand names. Kind of depends. Everybody's a little different on that one. Okay, controlled substances, more uh, high level drugs. Okay, they're put into schedules. Okay, so Schedule 1, this has a high, high potential for abuse. There's no currently accepted medical use for treatment in the U.S. Okay, might have been at one time, but there is not currently. So examples, heroin, peyote, LSD, none of those have an accepted medical use right now in the U.S. Okay, ironically, all three of them did at one time or another. And in some other countries, they may still, but not here. Okay, so these are the highest levels. These are typically the ones if you get caught with, you're probably going to go to jail and you go and get screwed, picked up. Okay, in several different ways if you want to look at it that way. Schedule two, um, the drug has a high potential for abuse. Okay, has a currently accepted medical use for treatment in the U.S. or it may have some severe restrictions. Okay, abuse of the drug will can lead to severe psychological and physical dependence. Same with the Schedule 1, it can have the psychological and physical dependence, obviously. Heroin, okay, there's a reason why people keep going back to it. It's not because I think they like shooting themselves up. I think it's because there's a physical and psychological dependence, okay? Examples, Ritalin, Demerol, which is a type of painkiller. Percocet, another type of painkiller, okay? Ritalin, who knows what Ritalin is for? Really, I have no one with ADHD in this class. 
that's wow. That's a new one. Ritalin is one of the things that helps with ADD, ADHD. Okay, attention deficit disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Okay, schedule three. They still have a high, or they have a potential for abuse, but it's less than those in one and two. Because if we keep going, we get a little bit less. Okay, abuse of the drug, you may have moderate or low physical dependence or high psychological dependence. Kind of depends. So examples of a schedule three would be Vicodin, type of painkiller. Or to have another type of painkiller. Okay. Anabolic steroids. Okay. Um, schedule four. Again, keep going. So once the highest five is the lowest potential for abuse and other problems. Okay. Um, they may have limited psycho uh, psychological or physical um, dependence relative to category three. So examples. Valium, which is something that helps you go down. Usually they give it to you in the hospital, and usually you go to sleep for about the next three or four hours. Or so, Ativan can help with seizures. Darvacet is another type of painkiller. Ambien, sleep aid. Okay, um, that's schedule four. Schedule five, these have a, again, lower potential for abuse. They can still be abused. Okay, they can have limited psychological and physiological physical dependence. Okay, Lomatil, which is ironically a um, it's a drug that helps with I believe diarrhea. I don't know why that's why somebody would want to keep doing that, and but you know what? Whatever works for you, I guess. Okay, Robitussin with codeine, cough syrup with codeine. Okay, that's a Schedule Five drug. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yes, I remember that one. I like that one. Okay. Um, the ones, okay, if you get caught with a Schedule 1 drug, you get caught with the higher ones, there's stiffer penalties. Schedule 5, there's a little bit lower penalties. Okay. Um, yeah. Some of the uh, marijuana, I believe, is a, it's a schedule, well, it used to be a Schedule 1. I think they're finally moving it down to a Schedule 2 because it does actually have accepted medical uses in the U.S. now. But um, about half the time, it still has the Category uh, 1, it still has a Schedule 1 penalties. So that's one of those, these were, these came up with in like the 70s. So they haven't really adapted to the times very well. So they're probably going to have to make some changes, but they have not yet. All right, that is it for today. See you on.